morning we'll be reading from Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain, his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, you will, not, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me away today. You have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills vain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God of goodness and beauty and truth, and that you share that truth with us in your scriptures. We confess, Lord, that we, like Cain, are prone to sin, and it is in us, and we just thank you that you have given us your son Jesus to restore us to full communion with you. We pray today uh, that we will open our hearts to the words of your scripture and that Cody faithfully uh, communicates them to us and that we will hear and learn and obey. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can have a seat. Hey, thank you, Mike. Appreciate you uh, sharing God's word with us today. Um, guys, um, welcome to the Table Church. My name is Cody. I get to be one of the pastors here. Um, it is the third Sunday of the month, so if you've been coming to the table for very long, you know that on the third Sunday of the month, we do a finance update. We just want to be open, transparent about um, where our money, uh, how much money's come in, what we spend it on. So I'm going to do that for about two or three minutes, and then we're going to dive into this text and break it down for us. So let's go ahead. This is the August um, finance update. Our budgeted giving was $26,376. Our um, actual giving was $24,169, um, so a little bit under our budget, but our actual expenses was only $22,800, so we're under, um, under, we're, yeah, we're under budget, but under spending as well, so that's good, we're in the black, that's what that means. Um, we also give away money, we give away to missions, we want to see lives continually changed by Jesus in parts all over the world, and we do that through the SIN Network, through the Southern Baptist Convention, the Cooperative Program, and also through the Pillar Network, and that amount came to $2,658.68. Um, the next steps that were taken 
um, we, we kind of track like how, how are people moving and what steps are being done? How well are we growing as a church? And not just in finances, but also in serving and generosity and, and community and discipleship. Um, we didn't baptize any of our friends in August, but we've already baptized one in um, this month in September. We're baptizing another next week. Um, we're baptizing one of our elders' daughters. And then I found out also this morning we're baptizing another one of our elders' daughters in October. So, yeah, we're so, so excited about that. Um, we had three people that were new to groups that got into groups or Bible studies and said, hey, I want to plug in. I want to become a learner. We had um, no people serving on teams, but I'm going to try to remedy that here in just a minute. We had one person that was a new giver, and we had six new members, someone who's taken all of those steps. And their new members said, we're going to partner with this church locally and to see lives continually changed by Jesus. Now, we always highlight a team and, you know, just to try to tell what some of these teams are in the church. This week, we're highlighting the Connections team. The leader of the Connections team, I like this lady. I like her so much that I, I mean, I try to get a date with her and sneak a kiss. As soon, I don't do that with every team member. Um, thank the Lord. Um, but, uh, but with this one, I do. And so I can tell you a whole lot about her, but I won't. But she is our Connections leader. Her name is Lori. She's my, my wife. And she actually helps. She helps people do those next steps. She helps people get connected. Connected onto service teams, using their gifts, their talents, their abilities. Connecting people to groups where they can grow. Connecting people to baptism if that's a step they've never taken. My wife helps do that. And so if you have not done that, I want to encourage you to see her today. She'll be back there at the info table. And if you're interested in helping her on her team to do those kinds of things, you can see her at the info table. I hope that there's a big old line back there after church, honey. I hope they're just, you know, stand in line to, to see more about that. So anyway, that's, that's all I got for that. Let's go ahead and jump into our text. This is the second week in our fall series called Jesus the True and Better. Last week we saw that Jesus was the true and better Adam. That he succeeded in the garden where Adam failed in the garden. Adam's sin cast us all into sin where we're, we're born into a separated state from God. Doesn't mean that we're, that's not salvageable. It just means that we start out at a disadvantage. Jesus... He succeeded. He was sinless. And he offers us his righteousness. Now, we're going to be one chapter over from where we started last week, Genesis chapter 4. And I want you to notice this. Adam sins by just eating from the wrong tree, which you may say, well, that's not that big of a deal. But it is a big deal when, it's, when you realize that his sin is unbelief. He did not believe God. God said, don't eat of that, and the day that you eat of it, you, you shall surely die. And he believed the lie instead of believing what God had said. And that's basically where all sin stems from, is not believing God. Now that sin that Adam committed in the Garden of Eden metastasized, and by the next chapter, his son murders another one of his sons. So this is, uh, when we say, well, sin's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so I, I said last week, sin will take you further than you want to go, make you pay more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. Like, sin is a big deal. But... It's all rooted in unbelief. Adam and Eve rebelled against God by trying to become like God. That was the temptation. You'll be like God. You'll be gods yourselves. You'll know everything God knows. And so you'll be able to do everything God can do, which is a lie. See, it wasn't enough for Adam and Eve to be made in God's image. They wanted his throne. It wasn't enough for them to be given dominion over the earth. They wanted dominion over heaven as well. So eating from the forbidden tree metastasized into jealous anger and murder just one chapter later. 
here with Cain and Abel. And what we have to understand is that sin condemns us all. It cries out for our punishment. We all have blood on our hands because we've all rebelled against God. And we've rebelled in those, in those same ways. I know that we look at the scripture and we say, well, I'm not as bad as Cain and Abel. Well, I'm, we're, I'm not as bad as Adam. I'm a much better husband than Adam was to Eve. Or maybe you look at it and say, well, I'm a much better wife than, than, than Eve was to, you know, Adam. I, you know, or I, or I'm a much better son. You know, I've never killed, I've never killed my brother. I've never killed my, my sister. I've, I'm much, I'm much more right. See, that in and of itself, we start establishing our own self-righteousness based on our own merits. And the root reason behind all that is so that we can be the gods of our own little universes. We want to be in control. Which is the root of unbelief. But, so sin condemns us all. We all have blood on our hands. And that blood cries out for punishment. But Jesus is the true and better Abel whose blood does not cry out for our punishment, but cries out for our pardon. And we see this in the text. So I want to walk us through Genesis chapter 4, and then I want us to go over at the end into Hebrews chapter 12 and see how the New Testament compares this and contrasts this. But first, let's just go ahead and walk through this. We have to understand if the root... The root sin for all of us is unbelief. We have to understand the nature of that unbelief and what it does. And we see that, how unbelief works itself out in this life and in this exchange, in this conversation between God and Cain. The first thing that we see is that unbelief for Cain escalates, and we have to understand that our unbelief always escalates into something far more heinous, far worse for Cain, it escalated into jealous anger. Look at verses 3 through 5. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. So what was Cain so angry about? He was jealous. God approved of Abel's offering, but he didn't approve of his. Now, I don't want to have a show of hands, but if I were to ask, have any of you ever dealt with jealousy? Have any of you ever sat and thought, I deserve that promotion. I deserve that, that position. I deserve that. They're not better than me. They're... I, Folks, you and I are going to have to come to grips with the fact that God gives, God does not bless everyone equally with talents. Like, I'm never going to play in the NBA. Matter of fact, I'm never going to play in Major League Baseball. And you say, well, yeah, of course, because you're 51. Listen. There are people that I know and love that could have told you that when I was five. <laughs> I'm not blessed with every skill. I, I, I'm not blessed with, with all the skills that I want. We see this in the New Testament. God gives one servant five talents. He gives another one two. He gives another one one. He doesn't give talents to everybody equally. But he does make a way. And God had told, and we see this, if we go back, when, God, when Adam and Eve had sinned, what did they do to cover up their nakedness? They got leaves. They, they killed a plant. Now, I don't know what kind of plant it was, other than the fact that I have been alive long enough and I have cut down enough weeds that I know once you separate a plant from its source, from the root, it's just a matter of time that thing is going to wither and wilt and pretty soon it's going to become crumbly. 
which does not make for a good pair of pants. <laughs> None of y'all are wearing pants that you like, hurry up, preacher, go. My pants are about to crumble. I, I got time. You, you got to go. But no, we, we've, we've made better things. We've known how, but at this time, they didn't have anything. They did what as best they could do. What does God do? God comes in and he commits, he, he, he takes the first blood. He kills part of his own creation because he knows that that is going to make a better suitable garment for them. Which is all pointing to one day when God is going to give something much, much more precious than just an animal. He's going to give his son. And we see this over and over. Like God early on said, the payment for sin, the punishment for sin is not our works. It's not how good we can do. It's not how, it's not how good of a garment we can make. No, we need something that we can't do ourselves. And Hebrews says this later on in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And God was hinting at that all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. So it's no surprise here in Genesis chapter 4 that God has regard for Abel's offering because he is a keeper of the flocks, but he doesn't have regard for Cain's offering who brought for him fruit of the ground. Now that's not to say that Cain couldn't have traded with Abel. Here, let me give you this basket of tomatoes. Give me a lamb so I can sacrifice the lamb. And God, if that would have happened, God would have had regard for Cain's offering. But he didn't do that. He thought he could worship God any way he wanted to. He thought he could bring any sacrifice that he wanted to God. And God said, no. But instead of being corrected by it, he gets jealous about it. You see the autonomy? He thinks that God should accept whatever sacrifice he feels like he should offer. Now at that point, I want to just ask this. Have you ever done anything like that? Oh, I have. Oh, I've brought offerings before and I thought, well, this is great. And it wasn't. We can't worship God any way we choose. We can't just bring God any offering. And we must guard our hearts against jealous anger toward those whom the Lord has regard for. Especially if they're walking in obedience. So unbelief escalates into jealous anger. But also another thing about unbelief. Unbelief disregards warnings against sin. Look at verses 6 through 8. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. Some versions say its desire is to have you. But you must rule over it. So this comes down to we have some responsibility. But Cain spoke to his brother Abel. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. This was premeditated murder. And it was born from unchecked, jealous anger. God provided a check. God provided advice. God provided questions. God came to Cain. He says, why are you angry? Why is your face down? Like Cain couldn't have hid his anger. It was written all over him. And God came to him in grace. He confronted him in grace. Not to condemn him, but to res restore him. says, listen, you can do well. You, you can offer a sacrifice. I'm not saying that, you know, just you as a person, you're done. He's like, no, but there's ways. I can't let you just 
autonomously believe that you can worship me any way you want to. That's not going to go well for society. So we went to him. Like Galatians 6.1. Paul tells us to do this in the church. He goes, brothers, if you see someone caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, go to them and restore them in a, in a spirit of gentleness. You see, the idea of confrontation about sin is never to condemn and to cast out. The idea of confrontation of sin is always to restore. It's always to lead to repentance. But, man, we don't like it. I mean, do any of y'all just naturally like when someone confronts you for a sin? I don't. If you do like it, please come counsel me. Tell me your steps, oh master. Like I let me learn from you in your ways. Like our sinful nature, we don't like it. I'm not saying it's always going to feel good to be corrected or to be confronted, but it is necessary because we're not perfect. It is good and right and godly to warn those we love against sin. It can be done in a judging way. I know that. Jesus knows that. But not all correction is judgmental. There's a difference between Judging and judgmentalism. Anytime we're called out in correction, well, there is an aspect of judgment with that. We're saying, hey, that's not right. That's not good. Judgmentalism says, you're not right. You're not good. You see, there's a difference in it. So, Cain disregarded the warning against sin. And he went ahead and went through with his plan and killed his brother. Third thing, unbelief repudiates the responsibility for sin. Oh, we see this one all the time. Look at Galatians 4, 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Now, we learned last week when Adam had sinned and God came and says, Adam, where are you? And we learned that God, because he is all-knowing, did not ask that question because he genuinely did not know where Adam was. Like, not a good idea to play hide-and-seek with God. You're going to lose. So this time he comes to Abel and he goes, Abel, where, where is your brother? Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Cain's answer reveals so much about his heart. Number one, he said, I do not know, which is a bald-faced lie. It's like, bro, (laughs) you killed him. You know exactly where he is. You whacked him. You Joe Pesci'd the guy. You know where he is. But the other one is like he turns and asks a question on God, still seething with anger. By the way, the murder of his brother did nothing to fix his heart. Have you all seen that? It didn't help him. He thought Abel was his problem, and getting rid of him would solve his problems. It didn't solve anything. It deepened it. He says to God, am I my brother's keeper? You can just see the, you you just feel how slimy, icky, rebellious, arrogant that is. He defiantly questioned God. Now the question is, do we do things like that today? And the answer is yes. Here are some ways that we repudiate responsibility for sin okay here's some ways that that i've heard in the in the years that i've been a pastor people that i've talked to 
here's the way that I hear this a lot of times. Some people say, well, I didn't know. I, I didn't know it was a sin. Which may be legit. But then sometimes you tell them, and they keep on. <laughs> well, now you do know, so now you can't use that excuse anymore. Here, here's another one. Well, everybody sins, so it ain't that big of a deal. Right? We say, like, my sin's not, it's not as bad as this guy over here. Why are you, aren't there bigger things you should be concerned about? Here, here's another one. The Bible doesn't address this. By and large, most of the people who use that one have never read the Bible. Just saying. So my answer to that is like, listen, before you go using that one, I think you should read it. All of it. And until you have, you can't use that excuse because you don't know. I'm just guessing the Bible's going to address it. I've read the thing cover to cover several times. I've never found one thing. I've never found one sin in my life that the Bible does not address. Here's another one. This one gets into a little bit more um, kind of more devotional, more touchy-feely. God knows me and my real intentions. Oh, I think he does. I, I know he does. And he knows that the inclinations, the intentions of the man's heart are continually evil. That's what it's going to devolve to by the time we get to Genesis chapter 8. Here's another one that's a little bit more, not so devotional or touchy-feely. It's a little bit more philosophical. Sin cannot be that big of a deal. Or God would not have let it happen in the first place. You see, it puts the accusation back on God. Which goes back to Adam and Eve. It's like, oh, Adam, did you eat from the tree that I told you not to? The woman, the woman that you gave me, gave it to me. Like, he, it puts it back on God. Here's the thing, guys. We've got to own our sin. We've got to own it. We can't make excuses for it. We have to confess it and turn to Christ. We can't sweep it under the rug. We can't minimize it. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist. We can't say that we're not responsible for it. We've got to own it. We've got to confess it. And we've got to turn from it. Unbelief repudiates responsibility. It goes on, it gets a little deeper. Unbelief protests the punishment for sin. Look at verses 4, 10 through 14. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Abel's blood was crying, crying out to God for justice. Aren't you glad that we have a God that hears the pleas for justice? We have, we have a God that is not disinterested in justice. I know that sometimes we have people in our lives that really aren't interested in it much. But our God is interested in justice. Here's the problem. <laughs> that justice comes for us as well. As sinners. We go on to verse 11. God says to Cain, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your, from your hand. When you work the ground, remember what was Cain? He was a tiller of the soil. He worked the ground. It was already made harder because he was kicked out of the Eden with his mom and dad. The yield just didn't naturally give it up. But now it's going to be even harder because of the curse that is now upon him because of his sin. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And then he gets this. 
And whoever finds me will kill me. Well, ain't that the pot calling the kettle black, Cain? Didn't you do that? Now you fear what someone will do to you, which is what you did to your brother. And you don't think it's right at all. Cain protested the Lord's punishment of his sin. His work was going to become increasingly burdensome. He's going to be a fugitive, a nomad. He's going to be absence of the deep community that he had within his own family because he demonstrated that he couldn't live in real community. So, God hands him over. C.S. Lewis says this, There are only two types of people in the world. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says, Thy will be done. Like, that, that's Burger King. Have it your way. But it makes all the difference whether God's saying it to us or we're saying it to God. If we're saying to God, have it your way, man, that's a beautiful place to be. But if we're in the position where God has finally done enough with us that he says, have it your way, and hands us over, that's not a good place to be. Unbelief protests the punishment for sin. We see the hypocrisy. Whoever finds me will kill me. Listen, we don't naturally accept the consequences of our sin. We don't naturally accept that. We, we naturally object. The punishment's more than I deserve. But I want to I show you grace even in this passage. This sounds really, really heavy. And I hope that you're taking it personally. I hope that you're looking at it and not just thinking as you're hearing this and saying, oh, I know a guy like that. Oh, I know a woman like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, they do that all the time. I hope that we're not casting other people, throwing other people under the bus, but we're taking this and saying, how am I like that? This, when I was working through the sermon Monday and Tuesday, man, this thing raked me over the coals. I was like, oh, yeah. Lord, there's some dark corners in my heart that, oh, I can get jealous. Oh, yeah, I think I deserve more than they've been given. Oh, yeah, I'm, you know, that's a five-talent guy. I've got that many talents. Well, why don't I? I had to deal with my own jealous and anger. I'm not immune from this, and you're not either. But God is gracious. Just noting the passage, just the back and forth between God and Cain. You, I mean, just how many times God came to him despite his rebellion shows you something of the patience of God. I want you to know that he's patient with you. He wants to restore you. But he does have limits. The last thing I want us to notice in this is that Unbelief continues under divine protection. Look at verses 15 through 16. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Which again is another echo or foreshadowing back to Hebrews where God says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I will repay. So that we don't need to repay anyone evil for evil. God will do that. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. We're told later on he founds a city. This is the idea of common grace. That God allows Cain to live. That God allows him to live. He extends mercy to him through common grace. Allowing him time to repent. That God is not impatient. He doesn't rush into judgment. He gives time. But Cain never did. Fast forward to the book of Exodus. God has a covenant with a people called Israel. And he delivers them. And he gives them the law on Mount Sinai. 
And he says, this is how you're to love me, and this is how you're to love one another, the Ten Commandments. The first four deal with how you relate to God. The next six deal with how you relate to one another. Which again points to when Jesus is asked one time, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. On this hinges all the law and the prophets. See the continuity between the Old Testament and New Testament? The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. It's not like God is just grumpy and he's just worked a really hard work week all of his life and then he gets to the New Testament and he's in retirement. And he's just cool. He's in an RV buzzing around the, you know, no, it's not, no, there's a continuity. The God of grace of the New Testament, he also has grace in the Old. Unless you think that he doesn't have any wrath in the New Testament, I suggest you go read Revelation. But Exodus, God has a covenant with people. He gives them the law. This is how you're to love me. This is how you're to love one another. But they still struggle to get it right. They struggle for hundreds of years with idolatry. God finally sends them his son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But by and large, they reject him. But some of those Israelites believed and accepted Christ as the Messiah. And someone later on writes a letter to them demonstrating how Jesus is the fulfillment of all this stuff that they've longed for in the Old Testament. And it's called Hebrews. Because that's who the Israelites were. They were Hebrews. We come to chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. And this writer says, recounting this stuff from Exodus, and then he doesn't end with Exodus, he takes it all the way back to this fourth chapter in Genesis by the time we get to verse 24. Listen to what this writer says. He's encouraging these Hebrew background believers who are looking for Jesus, who have found him, and they're they're going back and reading the Old Testament and seeing him, and here's what he says. He goes, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. That's all Exodus stuff of how God delivered them out into the mountain of Sinai. And the sound of the trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could endure the order. They could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. God showing that he's holy, showing that you can't just approach him any way you want to. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. And to the assembly of the firstborn and who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Which begs this question, well, how are we made perfect? We're well acquainted with our sin. How can we be made perfect? And he says it in verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Christ's blood speaks a better word. Sin crouches at our door, but through Christ and through his sprinkled blood, we can master it. Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. We don't have to live in this terrifying fear of God and his law. The law shows us how deserving we are of punishment and condemnation and how much we don't measure up to God's standard of righteousness. And we can't say that we don't know and we can't point to others' sin and we can't say that sin isn't that big of a deal because otherwise why would God have went through all the trouble of sending Christ his only son his most treasured gift to die on the cross for sin we can't say that our sin is not that big of a deal Christ is the true and better able whose blood 
cries out not for our punishment, but for our pardon. And that's why we have good reasons to sing. And that's why we gather here every week. Christ has paid our sin debt in full. Christ has removed sin's curse on us as fugitives. And in fact, not only just brings us to his table as we as wanderers, natural rebels, he brings us into his table and he does something even more than that. He says, I'm going to send my spirit to take up residence within you. All on the basis that Christ shed his blood for our pardon. Christ's blood cries out for our pardon, for our acquittal. Not our punishment and our condemnation. So, what do we do with all of this? Let's repent of unbelief. And this is kind of crazy, but (laughs) repent of unrepentance. Cain was so unrepentant in his posture toward God he made excuses he was defiant and I don't know where you're at today I mean I know where some of you are and some of you know where I am and I'm just as one wanderer to another as one Christian to another as one who's been shown grace toward you who you also have been shown grace at least common grace Repent. Confess it. Own it. Sin dies when exposed to the light. It's a dark dwelling little fungus. It thrives in the dark. But as soon as you bring it into the light, it withers. And that's a good thing. Because the God who is on the other side of this calling for us is a God of grace. He's not a God that wants to cast us out, but a God who wants to bring us in. And all that is, all it costs us is just honesty. Honesty and confessing who we are and our need for Him. And then just believe. Believe in Christ. For the unbeliever, for the person who's never trusted in Christ, it's, this is the biggest step you'll ever take. And I get it, it's a big one. It's a scary thing to hand over control of your life to the God of the universe that you cannot see, taste, tell, smell, or touch. But you can feel Him. And you've been feeling Him probably for a long time. It's probably why you're at church. If you're not a Christian, why would you come to church? Something. God, You're feeling God. He's bringing you. He's drawing you to Himself. But he's holy, and he won't let you just approach him any way you want to. You have to approach him on his terms, and you have to plead the blood of Christ. You can't plead your own righteousness. You can't plead your own record. You can't plead how good of a person you are, because the fact of the matter is, you just ain't that good. And neither am I. But Christ is so gracious. He shows us who the Father really is. He's given us. He's made the way for us. And all we have to do is repent of our sin, confess it, own it, repent of it, and plead the blood of Christ. That cries out for our pardon says, Come, I will pardon you. I will totally forgive you. So believe. Trust in Christ. And when you do that, you become part of His family. You go from being a wanderer and a fugitive into having a seat at the table. Where he, there's fellowship. So how do you become part of this family? Like I said, repent and believe the gospel. You say, well, I've done that. What else do I need to do? Well, nothing to really be a part of the family. But for us to recognize it as a community, we, we baptize people. That's what Christ commanded us to do in the Great Commission. He commanded us to, that's how we... See, life baptism is the front door of the church. It's how we know who's part of the family. And then 
communion, which we're all going to take here in just a minute, or believers are going to take, baptized believers are going to take, that's the family meal. You don't come sit down at the table for the family meal without going through the front door. Come in. And then we sing. Festal gathering. We have good reasons to sing. Christ's blood cries out for our pardon, has given us pardon, has offered us relationship. We have good reasons to sing. So, repent and believe the gospel if you never have. Talk to us about baptism if you've never been baptized. Come and take communion. Know that Christ's blood covers you. It covers your sin. And then we'll go back to our seats and we're going to sing. Like a saved, sanctified, pardoned people who are no longer under punishment, no longer under condemnation, but in free, life-giving, familial relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ, His Son. Let me pray for you, and you respond as the Lord leads you. God, would you move amongst your people? God, would you make people that are not your people, would you make them your people today? Would you grant them repentance? Would you grant them belief? Would you draw them to yourself? Would you give them faith, like you said in Ephesians chapter 2? For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God, lest anyone should boast. So would you draw to yourself? Would you save? Would you sanctify? Would you comfort? Would you redeem? Would you confront in love and pardon in grace so that we can rejoice in all that you've done? In your good name we pray. Amen.